next bed. Great. What kind of God would send his son to die? Uh, it, it's a fair question. Um, and here's one way that we might seek to answer it. We might think that the idea of God sending his son to die is vicious, uh, sadomasochistic, and repellent. <coughs> Just wait for the slides so you can read it as I said. There we go. Maybe it's vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad, but for the ubiquitous familiarity which has dulled our objectivity. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them without having himself tortured and executed in payment? So that's a quote from uh, Richard Dawkins and his view on uh, why a God might send his son to die. Um, all through this week, we've been trying uh, to give a Christian perspective on this question and uh, on other difficult questions, and, and I hope if you have any interest in the sorts of questions that we've been raising, you'll uh, continue to ask those questions with the people in the, the green hoodies here or with the CU members that uh, you've gotten to know. You won't be surprised to hear that I'm going to give a slightly different take uh, today than, uh, than the one that Richard Dawkins gives, but not without admitting uh, that as Christians we're often pretty lousy uh, at trying to explain exactly why it is that we take Jesus' death to be so significant. Uh, here's one not so successful attempt that I heard recently. The person used the following analogy. There was a baby horse, a foal, whose mother had died, and therefore the foal had no mother horse to nurse him. He only did have another adult female horse, and he tried everything to get this horse to nurse the foal, but she wouldn't because it wasn't her own offspring. But then, when the female horse's own foal dies, the owner has the genius plan to cut the skin off of the dead foal and drape it over the orphaned foal. And now, because the orphaned foal smells like her own offspring, the female horse is deceived into thinking that it is her own and begins to nurse it. Now, let me admit that I have some trouble connecting with this analogy. My experience of horses is pretty slim. Uh, my experience of cutting the skin off of dead baby horses is zero. But even if I could connect with this story, what is it saying? That God actually has no interest in us but gets deceived into loving us? Of course, now that I said that, there's probably going to be someone in the room who uh, loves the horse analogy, became a Christian through the horse analogy, and has seen hundreds of people become Christians through the horse analogy. Since, if that's you, uh, I'm sorry, and praise God for his resourcefulness. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a Christian home myself, but I decided to become a Christian uh, when I was 19, and in part because I came to believe that Jesus' death was the greatest expression of God's love for us. Today I want to tell you a, a few reasons why I think that's the case, and they have to do both with how Jesus died and with why Jesus died. So I'll start with how Jesus died. And those of you who were here yesterday, I considered this yesterday as well. I'm just going to repeat it uh, this next couple minutes or so because I think this question of how Jesus died actually tells us quite a lot about who he is and whether he's the sort of person worth following. Sigmund Freud once said, if you're pushed to your visceral limit, the real you comes out. And when you're at the point of greatest pain, greatest frustration, when you're insulted, when you're shamed, when you're stepped on, and stepped on again. Okay, that's when you find out who you really are. And I know that what comes out of me in those times is often not very attractive. Okay, what came out of Jesus was love and compassion and forgiveness. Though the Roman judge found no basis for a charge against him, the Jewish leaders insisted that he be killed because he had claimed to be God. And so they stripped him, and they beat him, and they strung him up on a cross, it to slowly die one of the most shameful uh, and painful deaths that one could die. Jesus looked down from that cross at the people who were killing him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Okay, if Jesus forgave even then, then we can be assured that there is no sin that he will not forgive if we will just ask. Then he turned to his mother uh, and his best friend who were there, uh, with him, and he said to them, Mother, here is your son. And to his friend he said, Here is your mother. 
And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And even as Jesus hung dying, his first concern was not with his own life, but with his mother's life, and with making sure that she would be cared for after he was gone. And then one of the criminals who was being executed alongside Jesus began to insult him, began to heap insults on him. And he said, aren't you the Messiah? Well, then save yourself and us. But the other criminal, who was on Jesus' other side, he rebuked him. He said, don't you fear God? He said, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the final thing that Jesus did while he was on the cross, as he was struggling to take his last breaths, was to love the man next to him, a criminal, and to promise him salvation in response to his repentant heart and his trust in him. When the centurion, the soldier who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. And when he saw how Jesus died, then he knew that he could be trusted. Then he knew that he was who he claimed to be. Because when you're pushed to your limit, the real you comes out. And when we look at the way that Jesus died, when he was pushed to his limit, what came out was absolutely divine. Okay, why was Jesus so perfect in death? Why did he die with such utter integrity? Okay, because it's why he came in the first place. There is no notion in Christianity of Jesus being forced by the Father to come and die. As God himself... Jesus chose to come and live a human life, and he chose to come and suffer a human death. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. But why? Why would he do this? How Jesus died was remarkable, but why would he choose to come and live a human life and suffer a human death? Let me just begin to sketch three reasons that I think that he would do that. First, Jesus came to do the one and only thing that matters to someone when they're going through intense suffering. To come and join them in their pain and suffer alongside them. A few weeks ago, I was scrolling around on the Facebook page for boating and water safety, as you do, in case it ever gets warm enough to warrant a boat trip in England. And I came across an article that claimed that uh, when a boat sinks, women are more likely than men uh, to die. And there was this long online discussion about why that might be the case. But one of the things that stuck out to me was this one comment from a woman named Kristen. And here's what she said. She said, I am not surprised. A woman with children has probably the least chance of survival. I would rather die with my child than leave my child to die if I could save myself. Imagine being on a sinking ship, and a young child is stuck in a compartment which is slowly filling with water. And while you can drop down into that compartment, there's no way to get back out once you're in there. And the child is going to slowly die there. And the little boy or the little girl is distraught, and she's suffering, and she's scared. Imagine a parent who lowers herself down into the compartment, knowing that it will mean their death too. Just to be with the child in her suffering. To comfort her and to ensure that she won't suffer and she won't die alone. I would rather die with my child than leave my child to die if I could save myself. Is that such a barking mad thing to do? Not if you have a child. Hey, Joe and I, my wife Joe and I, we don't yet have any children of our own, but we do have two absolutely amazing godchildren. Uh, one of them is uh, Michelle's daughter, Sophia. And when we look at her, okay, when we hold her, we get it. Okay, we start to understand. It might seem crazy to make a sacrifice like that in most instances, okay, but not for the people that you cherish most. And I wonder what does that say? about who we must be to God, and to a God who would rather come and suffer with us than not suffer without us. John Stott, he's a was a Christian vicar and a writer, he died last year, but I think he identified this 
uh, parental love of the Christian God as well as anyone. And here's what he said. He said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of the Buddha. His legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time after a while I have had to turn away, and in imagination I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. Ironically, it was Nietzsche, the very one who ridiculed God on the cross, who wrote this. He said, the gods justified human life by living it themselves. The only satisfactory response to the problem of suffering ever invented. Nietzsche is writing of the ancient Greeks here, and remarkably, he doesn't make the connection to Christianity. Okay, but as a Christian, I'm very <coughs> pleased to agree with him. Because at the cross, I think we see the uniqueness of the Christian response to suffering. Because only in Christ do we have a God who loves us enough to suffer with us. They mocked Jesus while he was on the cross. He saved others. Let him save himself. And with the heart of a parent, Jesus responded, I would rather die with my children than leave my children to die and save myself. I think that's one reason that Jesus came and suffered a human death. But Jesus' ultimate reason for suffering and dying on the cross, I believe, was to save us from our sin, to take our punishment himself so that we could be free of it. Now, our society sometimes works pretty hard to avoid uh, the question of sinfulness, to avoid admitting that we're sinful. And I was reminded of this recently when I had to apply for a marriage visa uh, to stay in the UK. And on the official form, in order not to get deported, I had to answer no to this question. Have you or any dependents who are applying with you ever engaged in any other activities which might indicate that you may not be considered to be persons of good character? I just cracked up laughing you know, when I read that. I think the Americans are tough on immigration. <laughs> I might as well have said, have you ever done anything wrong? I think that if we're honest, even from our own perspective, we can all admit that some of the things that we think and say and do, and some of the things that we neglect to do when we should do them, can be pretty bad. But I think it's also worth noting that our perspective is probably not the most accurate one. I can remember things that I used to do that at the time I thought were no big deal. But now, I can recognize as truly terrible. In the way that I used to speak about people, the way that I used to treat people, the way that I used to put them down, and at least one of those people years later went on to kill himself. Now that God has led me away from some of those things, that I used to do. I can look back on them and see them more accurately for what they truly were. And I'm right about those things now. I was wrong about those things then. Okay, and I've taken minimal steps at best. God has worked in some areas of my life, but I'm still so imperfect in so many ways. Imagine how far along that path God would be. And his perspective would be the perfect one. His perspective would be the true one. And from that perspective, looking back, okay, none of us would look very holy. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to appreciate this until we're in the presence of someone who's holier than ourselves. My wife Jo, she once wrote me out a list of 40 things that she wanted me to know about her that no one else knew that she wanted me to know before we got engaged. 
And she wanted uh, to make sure that I wanted to step into marriage with all of her, uh, and not just the portions that she brings out in the light. It was a beautiful thing to do, uh, traumatizing, uh, but beautiful. And so Joe began to talk me through this list, and when we got down to number 19, Joe said, now this one I'm really ashamed of. And in fact, I think this may be the worst thing that I've ever done to you. And at this point, I'm trying to keep a calm appearance, uh, but I'm freaking out inside. And you can just imagine the things that are running through my head. She's cheated on me. She's a Russian spy and has to kill me because I know too much. <laughs> She's really a man. <laughs> And then Joe explained that one day, when we were already looking at photos on my computer, and I took a break to go to the loo, she simply continued perusing the files on my computer to continue looking at old photos of me. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Photo stalking? That's the worst thing you've ever done to me? I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> Our sin is magnified by how good the person whose presence we're standing in is. And that's why I think the criminal who hung next to Jesus on the cross, when he saw the integrity with which Jesus died, then he knew that his own punishment was just. And I think that's why Christians say that when we all stand in God's presence one day, that on that day we'll all be able to recognize our need for a Savior. And the great news of the Christian faith is that God loves us too much to let us bear the judgment for our sin ourselves. But how exactly... Does Jesus' death help matters? It is the guilty who are responsible for their sins. If instead Jesus is punished, how is that justice? They say I get a bit nostalgic for my boxing career and I begin to severely assault you by throwing punches in your direction. It would hardly make you feel like I had been justly punished if I pointed out that some other guy who had nothing to do with it had been thrown in jail for my crime instead. And that would be ridiculous. Well, let's change the scenario a bit. What if I began hitting you? And then when I went to hit you again, okay, Joe, seeing this from the other side of the room, came over and threw herself between it. And instead, my punch hit her. Okay, and it sent her head flying back into, say, a stone wall, and it actually killed her. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> Imagine if that happened. And when I saw the consequences of my actions, and for the one that I love most, I broke down in agony in front of you, and I pleaded for your forgiveness. At that point, would you still feel like I hadn't been punished justly for my actions? I suspect not. Why? Because how could I possibly be punished more severely than losing the one I love most, and at my own hands. Nothing could be greater punishment. It would be callous and cruel to demand more. On the cross, God threw himself between us and every person that we have ever wronged. He took the full impact of our sin. He suffered the punishment. If we don't love Jesus, then his death is just the death of some stranger. Just some random guy serving our jail sentence. And there is no justice in that. Then we are still under judgment. But if we love Jesus, then when we stand beneath the cross and see his death, the death of the one that we love most, resulting from our sin, then we have received just consequences. Justice has been fulfilled. The cross is where perfect love and perfect justice Intersect. It's where God says it's not okay to just look the other way when people are raped and abused and enslaved. <clears throat> that there do have to be serious consequences for that. But it's also where God says that he can't stand to see any of his children bear those consequences. And so he takes them on himself. Jesus died for our suffering. He died for our sin. And finally... I believe that he died for our shame. Just when I thought I had gotten past the worst in Joe's list of 40 things that no one knew about her, we came to number 37. It was only four words, but it was 
four words that you just never expect to hear from your significant other. I am a Trekkie. <laughs> That's right. Joe loves Star Trek. This is something very few people know about my wife Jo, until right now. <laughs> Sorry, hon. She's done a pretty good job of hiding this embarrassing fact from me. I still think she only told me because a new Star Trek movie had come out in the theaters, and she had to tell me so that I would take her. One of the few things more embarrassing than being a Star Trek fan is going to see a Star Trek movie by yourself. So Jo uh, read me number 37, and I could tell when she did that she thought I would think less of her for it. That she thought that she had reason to be ashamed. And so we arranged to meet at the cinema, and when Joe got there, I was standing out front, uh, proudly wearing uh, a t-shirt of Mr. Spock's face, saying, live long and prosper. Particularly embarrassing with my pointy Vulcan ears. <laughs> hey. <laughs> And I was also holding open a, a, a massive Star Trek poster, which read, and read, to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> but as Joe approached me at the theater, she had tears in her eyes. I didn't expect that. And she just so she threw her arms around me for uh, the biggest hug. And then I started to realize at that point that for me to literally wear her shame, her embarrassment, it freed her from having to be embarrassed. And I told her, I'll never be ashamed of you, and so you never need to be ashamed of yourself. God used a, a funny t-shirt and a ridiculous poster to teach me and Joe something very significant about him that night. That Jesus not only died for our sin, but I believe he also died for our shame. I don't know about you, but I know that for both me and for Joe, some of the hardest memories for us to shake are times when we've been shamed. It may be a time that I was mocked or ignored, uh, or uh, a time when I was overlooked. Sometimes just a couple of words, and they can stick with me for years. Words that just say, you're ugly you're not good enough, or you're not worth the time. Naked on the cross, Jesus took on himself every time that we've been mocked, every time that we've been spat on, every time we've failed, every time we've been abused, exposed, ignored, overlooked. When he put on human flesh, he literally clothed himself in all of it. So that, as the Bible says, anyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, and everlasting joy will be yours. On the cross, Jesus says, you don't have to be ashamed of whatever it is that you've been through, because I've been through it too. And he says, you never need to be ashamed of yourself, because I will never be ashamed of you. Why did Jesus choose to come and die? I believe he did to suffer alongside those who suffer, to offer forgiveness for sin, to offer freedom from shame. What kind of God would come and die? A God of love. Okay, a God who, who loves each and every one of us. For there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And this is how we know what true love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And at its core, this is what it means to be a Christian. To place your trust in a person who is willing to give his life for you. And to commit to following Jesus' example by being a person who is willing to give your life for others. Jesus' death for us is the greatest gift that I know. Okay, and the way that we accept that gift is just by telling him that we'll trust him with our lives. Just by telling him, I'm sorry and thank you. Simple words said sincerely, that's all that he asks from us. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. I'm sorry for my sin, which put you there. 
I'm thankful that you didn't give up on me. I'm thankful that you were willing to go to even that extent in order to be with me and to lead me into new life. And that's why I think that the cross is right at the center of the Christian faith and why it's so central to my understanding of why God loves each and every one of us. Now, some of you are just coming for the first time today. Some of you have been coming all week, and perhaps you've been learning quite a lot about Christianity over the last few days. Maybe there are a few people here tonight who want to say that simple uh, commitment to God today, who want to say that I am actually at the point where in response to the greatest love that you showed me on the cross by actually giving your life for me, living a human life you didn't have to live, suffering a human death you didn't have to die in order to be with me, and I want to respond by saying, I'm sorry and thank you, and I want to trust you moving forward. And so I'm just going to take a minute uh, to pray a simple prayer, which basically says that. And if you're someone who's in the room who just wants to say that uh, to God today, then feel free to just sort of echo that heart, uh, that prayer in your heart as I pray it, and just sort of make it your own. I recognize not everyone in the room will be in that place, but thanks for just bearing with me for just one minute. God, I thank you for this time together. Uh, thank you for each person in this room uh, for their willingness to give me a generous hearing today. I believe you when you say that there's no greater love than to give your life for another. And I'm humbled by the fact that you would choose to give your life for me. That you would choose to suffer with me. That you would choose to take the consequences of my sin on yourself that you would identify with my shame so that I never need to be ashamed. I know very often I haven't lived up to the love that you have called me to. I ask for your forgiveness, and I ask that you would come into my life and make me someone who will love others as you have loved me. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was really generous of you to listen to me so well. Thank you uh, for giving me that time. We have um, feedback cards that are scattered around with pens. I'd be really grateful if, if each of you would just take one of those um, now.